When Martin Flies. I arrived at Martin Ham's funeral service just in time to take a seat in the choir loft. The cathedral was packed with mourners for this larger than life man. He had been my art history and literature teacher at the Altamont School, as well as the director of many dramatic productions in which I had participated. He called me Beetle, as in Beetle Bailey. Some things just stick in my mind, like the day he wrote picaresque on the chalkboard, or the time I was up at school on a college holiday and he cornered me asking, Beetle, you still smoke pot? Or the time he stormed over to a boy loafing in study hall and grabbed up his book. He thrust the book at the boy and proclaimed, if you're not going to read it, put it to your head and put it to your head and perhaps you'll learn through osmosis. This is one of my personal favorites. In his office, I met with the college rep from Harvard who informed me that I could not apply to Radcliffe because Harvard had gone co-ed and the women's college was no more. He did suggest that I apply to the women's college at Columbia University, Barnard College, and I did. My only application, early decision. And off I went to Barnard College in the fall of 1980. As the funeral service began, memories of Mr. Hames were banging around in my heart and in my mind. Fragments of his living being played in a montage of years and situations. The way he shucked a candy bar of its wrapper or pulled his ankle up to cross it on his knee. The black shoes he wore, the profusion of perspiration pouring from his head, his sculpted nose spreading above an even broader smile that could warm or chill depending on his will. I could see his fleshy hands holding up a book while the other hand extended out to orchestrate his reading of a sonnet. The morning when we recited the introduction to the Canterbury Tales in his room at the end of the hall buzzed through my mind. And there I sat in the choir loft of the cathedral and he was dead. The eulogy began and I tried to focus on the words being said, but I was removed somehow, deepening into a grief that held me apart from the group. His death was the loss of a constant in my life that spanned more than 26 years. The first time I saw him was at the production of Cyrano de Bergerac when I was a girl at Brook Hill School for Girls. From the choir loft perch, the shock of his absence brought forward the magnificent power of his presence in my journey. At some point in the funeral, I became aware of a sound, and as the sound caught my attention, I listened for the point of issue. My eyes followed the sound to the left, to the tops of the stained glass windows. I didn't see anything, but I heard the sound slowly gaining strength and I continued to train my eyes on the sound that was now becoming clearly identifiable as a buzz. And then my eyes joined sight with sound and I saw a small dark shape crossing the space of the cathedral at my eye level, coming closer and looking larger. The people around me did not seem to notice, 
and I did not wish to distract them. The buzzing became louder still, and now I saw a large beetle flying in my direction. The beetle landed on the left shoulder of the finely outfitted woman to my right, and I considered. She had not noticed, but I imagined that she would notice relatively soon, since this handsome beetle was quite large. I acted swiftly and reached out. I scooped the beetle from her shoulder while commenting to her, you had a bug on your shoulder. And during the remainder of the service, I held the robust beetle in gently cupped hands while it crawled about exploring my palms. When the service was over, I took the creature outside and set it down at the base of a tree. This world is always communicating if we allow ourselves to listen. Life and death are not open and closed affairs when it comes down to it, and it always does. What is there but trust when a man who called me Beetle for almost three decades dies, and as I parse his life in mine, he flies?